My name is Leon Green. I'm a 97-year Holocaust survivor. I went to four concentration camps, and I am here today to this story that you should never forget, especially for today's youth. They should remember what happened to us. And this is my story. I was born in Poland and I lived all my life with, uh, until two years and we moved uh, from Germany, uh, to Germany. In 1938 they again threw us out overnight without anything and we just started a new life in Poland. Until we lived in Germany normal life until Hitler came to life. There the harassment started, all Jews were harassed. All kind of stuff happens. We went down, uh, unfortunately, we lived a normal life until my father in 1927 passed away from uh, injuries from World War I. Then a little, it started a little harder for my mother. We were four, four children, and I'm the only one survivor today. Uh, life went on until 1938. All, all, all of a sudden, a German police came to our houses and said, you're a Polish citizen, you have to report to the police station to check your passports, which was a big lie. <coughs> they took us to the police station, kept us overnight. In the morning, they took police trucks off to the railroad station, took us over the border and left us in the middle of the, in the lawn there on the, over, on the Polish border until Polish police came, didn't know what happened here. Some people spoke Polish, explained it to them. They said you could go anywhere you want, go to the next police station, have your passport stamped, and go wherever you want. We went, the first stop was Krakow. We came to Krakow, the people already knew what happened, the Jewish family service took care of us, we lived in our, uh, almost half a normal life because <laughs> we were just supported by the Jewish community. We had nothing. We came to Poland without anything, just with our shirt on our back. Start, World War II started. <coughs> again, the harassment started. All Jews again were harassed. We, uh, we escaped. I never spoke Polish, so my two cousins and me, we took off uh, on foot, start walking, start escaping. We tried to go towards Russia. We never made it because we were caught where the war was still going on in the town of Ravaruska. There, all of a sudden, the German caught us again. My one cousin, he on the way, he bought a bicycle. He left. Uh, on a bicycle and he made it, he somehow wound up in Israel later on. My other cousin was caught and got lost and, and I did not know what happened to him anyhow. I remained myself. I tried to go back from this town. I walked, walked until I came on the street and there the German SS, the stormtroopers was there, motorcycles. I pretended to be a German and I spoke to him in German, if you take me home to Krakow. I said, yeah, be here in the morning, I'll take you there. Nobody was there. And again, I had to go walk and walk next railroad station. There I was caught again. Pol and Polish citizens, collaborators, says, oh, he's a Jew, he speaks German, he's a Jew. I spoke only German. Well, I escaped again, the next railroad station. Finally, I made it. I went on a railroad, on a railroad station in a big in a freight train and made it to Krakow. Short time later on, again, the ghetto started. We were taken to the ghetto. In the ghetto itself, at the liquidation of the ghetto, they was looking, from the beginning, they were looking for some skilled workers. They, they first, I'm sorry, they caught me on the street with big police trucks and stormtroopers, 
took us to army barracks. Wherever you worked, it's finished. You're now working for us. This was an a organization which called Department of Deportation and Labor. This was a department that took all Jewish citizens to death camps. I reported as a skilled worker, we were 12 men. And the end, I remained only with one electrician. As the ghetto was liquidated, and, and the, our, the organization had the, did the deportation there, and they liquidated the ghetto, and I remained only with this electrician. Everybody home for lunch, come back after lunch. After lunch, one man comes to me, you know, they took your mother and sister, the blood scurry, if you heard, in Schindler's List. This, their name is mentioned for the death camp deportation. I know what I'm going to do here. I approached my boss and told him this. I was lucky, he gave me a policeman, take him out. I took another woman out there, and somehow, thank God, they made it during the war. During the ghetto time, I worked, I was beaten up. At one, at one time, I worked for, the, for this company. There was one SS man, a German SS man, young fellows, younger than me, were riding on a bike. He broke his pedal on the bike. Whose fault? It's Leon's fault because he's the mechanic. I was beaten up. <laughs> he had my, with one hand, he had my face like this, and with the other hand, he beat me up there. And the Jewish policeman tapped me on my shoulder, oh, you're a brave man there. He was, I couldn't move. So why is I brave? Life went on again. One day, what happened? One young uh, Jewish boy escaped from the ghetto. There was another boy who saw the incident and he did not report it to the test. So all this group who worked in the ghetto to us, the whole group, we were ordered to go in the backyard, make a circle around this man. The man put, paid his, uh, put his gun to his neck and killed him. The gun didn't know for twice, but at the third time he killed him. I went to trial for him. I went to Germany for the war camp side, and it, he was sentenced in absentia because he escaped. Well, life went on again, again. <coughs> Excuse me. Later on, we worked, we worked until uh, the ghetto was liquidated, and we went the, up in the camp at Plaschow. There again, we worked for the, what they call, Instandsetzungswerkstatt, that is, we fixed all the belongings which were taken from Jewish people out from all Poland, had to fix it and sent to Germany. There again, I did something. I said, the time, it's almost finished work. I said, I'm gonna wash myself. While I'm washing myself, the German policeman, the German who was in charge of us, passed by through the window and saw me there. And called me there, he tried almost to kill me, hit me on the floor, kicked me. He did everything possible. I had no choice. Later on, we had to walk up to the camp. Everybody who worked with me in the shop, step out, all the men. Stand in line, pants down. We got hit 25 on the back with a horse whip. Woman standing here and we had to stand there. After this incident with the bicycle, <coughs> he caught, I mean, he broke his bike. Whose fault again, Leon? Come to the office, bent down, pants down, took his horse whip, again was beaten up. I had no choice because, you know, I was at his mercy there. What could I do? Later on, the ghetto was uh, liquidated. I mean, it was liquidated already. We was up in the camp already, and there started again harassment back and forth, back and forth. Every time something went on, 
Leon got beaten up. Everything a little bit, uh, my fault, because I was in charge of the shop there. Life went on until we were sent to a different camp, Mauthausen. Mauthausen, again, we were in, in, in the back. Also, my friend comes to me, Leon, you know what? My, uh, <laughs> excuse me, my, uh, <laughs> We had to go to uh, the Laos to the showers naked. And my friend comes to me and says, Leo, you know, I have a few diamonds. What am I going to do with them? I said, give it to me. I take care of them. What I did, I scraped out my fingernails, put the, the nails in there, they put some bread on there, hidden. The big one I swallowed. After we came out the shower, we had to come to the shower standing in front of him. If he would have seen this diamond, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Finally, I gave him the diamonds. This saved his life, and we met after the war again. Life went on. <coughs> we went to a different camp. This was, we were a short time. This was like a, a transit camp, Mauthausen. From Mauthausen, we went to a camp, San Valentin, where we uh, it was a company who made from, uh, from, uh, organized by Mercedes-Benz, and we did the biggest German tanks, the Koenigsegger, they call it. There again, <clears throat> I was assigned to the factory to a, 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 a late a machine making small precision parts. It happened that I got a, injured in a splinter. I was injured, a finger sw uh, swollen up. What are you going to do? Uh, you go to the uh, emergency, you go to Mauthausen, and you're no good for work. You're dead. No. The pain was too big, I had to go. I stuck a needle in there, put a pair of pliers, and pulled the nail out. Finish. Fortunately, light work inside the camp. I became the best bed maker in the camp. This way, I earned a little bit more bread there and sustained myself. Also, luck has it that the charge, the man in charge of Beric, he was from the same town from Germany I used to live. He was a German criminal. He was in the camp as a German criminal, not a, a Jewish uh, prisoner. This made my life a little bit easier because I did all kind of work for him. Ever as possible, I was handy to do this, this, just to keep myself going. Everything went done fine. This was a mixed block. Then they decided to change the all Jewish prisoner to one block. So there was one in charge of the room. He said, Leon, I want you in my room, the beds. I said, okay. But then was another Jewish prisoner here. He used to work in the office. And Leo, you don't have to make all this, uh, all this beds to make one bed. I give you the same soup. I said, okay. This man was after me. Anytime I stood in line for, for a little bit extra soup, I got hit. Any, any, any little thing, I got hit. The camp was evacuated to Ebensee at the Americans bombarded the, the factories and we were Ebensee to, to, to uh, transfer it to another camp in Ebensee. There he was nobody in charge. And what happened? All of a sudden, the all Jewish prisoners out to work carrying big rocks. Big rocks. This is not for me. I stood in line, came down from my bed, stood in line. After everybody went, I jumped back in the bed there. After everybody's gone, he saw me that I did not go to work. Again, he was after me. He tried at this time, he tried to kill me. He kicked me, had me on the floor, did everything possible to, to, to hurt me. What could I do? I worked later and I was assigned to a factory 
make the biggest the, for the tank the the biggest wheels that for the tank. The first wheel I made was like a sabotage because I made it smaller. And so I said that was shortly before the end of the war. I said to myself, don't worry about it. What went on? The war ended. One Yugoslavian prisoner, he saw what he did to me, this man. He called him and called me, took a big rock and smashed him to death. He said, that's it, I <laughs> did for me because he saw that he almost killed me. This was the end of the story on the camp. Later on, we went to, I lived for quite a while there in a, in a, in a camp, in a DGP camp, in the farmhouses, until we were again assigned to some, uh, some living quarters, and life went on until, uh, until 1940, uh, 1940, till 1946, I guess it was. <laughs> I have to remember dates, it's very hard. So, uh, and in 1949, I came to the United States. Any questions? I have a question. <clears throat> so, I just got back from Berlin and I went to see Topography of Terror, which is the SS. Uh, I don't love it in there. The SS Museum. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what surprised me was so many of the war criminals that they ultimately found or charged yeah. got off with nothing, especially that's right, in Germany. That's, that's right. They were all, after the war, they were yeah, because, uh, connected and they got off. Because some of them escaped and some of them denied that they did anything. But even though some of them came back, and, and were in Germany and they were in powerful positions after the war and were never, were never prosecuted. That's right, because uh, most of them denied that they did anything. I said, oh, we had to do this, we had to do this. I, I, I was called back to Germany. They invited us to my hometown where I used to live. All of a sudden I get a telephone call, a call I said, you know, this was already in the United States after you came back from Germany. You know, somebody wants to talk to you. Do you want to talk to him? And he says he's a friend of yours. He was a German. He was a Russia, He was a, in prison in Russia. He was a, a soldier, actually. I knew his family. He knew my family. He, the, the, the journalist asked me if I wanted to talk to him. I said, why not? It's no, no big deal, you know. But... Some, I had Germans there. I was in the Hitler Youth, and they were my friends. Right. Some of them, I beat them up. I was more athletic than them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was a small guy there. But some of them, I had one friend, his father was a policeman at the airport. They invited me to the house, and they, they, I was a little Jewish boy. They apologized to me, you know, Leo, they didn't hang out the Nazi flag, they hanged out only the German flag. They said, we must hang out this flag. Why do you have to apologize to me? I am nobody. That's what they said, some Germans. Another German, they, my friends invited me to a party once. Oh, very nice, everything. All of a sudden, one man come out, oh, you Jew, get out of here. You see? <clears throat> what year was that? This was in 1937, around 1937. So some of them, you could not show that you were a, a anti-Nazi. Otherwise you were arrested, harassed, or whatever. What do you think about the Polish government yeah. forbidding Poles to talk about the Holocaust? See, some Poles, some you were good Poles, and a lot of Poles were indoctrinated, and they became, like I said, collaborators. Like I said, I came to a railroad station once, you know, and like I said, Polish you, a young boy said, oh, he speaks German, he's a Jew. Get out of here, you know? I'm, I'm that, not sure he understood the question, but do you think everybody here knows what you're talking about? I hope they do. I don't right. know if they do. They don't. Mm -hmm. So, so, he said, so Lately, 
the year is a nationalistic movement that's taking part, taking place in Poland. Yeah. And the new president of Poland has passed a law yeah. in Poland right. that makes it um, verboten to talk about uh, Polish collaborators oh, right. and yeah. the role of, of, of Polish nationals right. in the Holocaust. There were plenty of Polish collaborators there. But now you can mm -hmm. go, if this law passes, if, it, if it, it's already passed, if it gets ratified, you can yeah. go to jail for either three yeah, years right. or you four too. years. So say Leon went back to Poland. He couldn't talk. If he was but there, this, this was no some, problem some, then. Some, nobody, and but somebody that they, interviewed him. And he told a story about somebody attacking his family that was a Pole. The person talking and Leon could go to prison for, for, for four years. I understand also that Lithuania is trying to pass a similar law. At the time we came to Poland, there was nothing going on like this. They just started this now, all of a sudden. Now. You see, I don't know why they started it, but they start making some trouble again. Unnecessary, you know. It's some Poles collaborated, some of them not. They're, they're not they're, some of them were not collaborating. There, some of them were killed, and some of them were eliminated. They did all kind of stuff. But when we came to Poland, it was uh, nothing going on. And it's just now it started. Just uh, just recently. Leon, yeah. did you get married? Did you have children? Yes, I have. Uh, I married at uh, the P camp. I had have uh, one son and one daughter, and I have three grandchildren. Did you ever go back to Poland? Yes, I smuggled some stuff to Poland. I did all kinds of stuff there. You know, I saved. Uh, I did all kinds of stuff, which is. Very hard to explain, you know. What made you come to the United States instead of Israel from the DP camp? We, uh, my sister for first emigrated with her family here. They, they sponsored her. Later on, my sister sponsored me and came to the United States. Because I had no way to go. That's the only way we had family here. How old were you when you left Europe? How old were you when you left Europe? Uh, when I left Europe, I mean, after the war, after the war, I was, I was born like in 1920. I was, uh, uh, Europe, I left uh, in 1949, so I was 29 years old. I have a question for you. Um, in, your, in your story, um, your, you said your parents were Holocaust survivors. And as a child, when you're sitting around the, the table, did, did your parents have the numbers on their arms? My, my, neither of my parents were in concentration camps. They weren't in concentration camps, okay. The, and many people who were in concentration camps <coughs> also were not tattooed. Okay. So it's a, it's a very small percentage of people. The, the definition that's used internationally of who is a Holocaust survivor is somebody whose life was disrupted or <clears throat> diverted, changed, catastrophized because of Nazi occupation into their homes. I mean, I ask that because um, my uncle um, was in a concentration camp. And so he had the numbers on his arm. And so when my sister and I were old enough, you know, to be able to verbalize, so what are those numbers? I mean, you know, they had to, it was something that they had to explain to us, you know, and I'm just surprised that so you, they kept well, okay, all that. So the other thing that's important though, that I, I think to think about, is that when you say somebody's a survivor, somebody's a survivor, survivor of an automobile accident, survivor of cancer, survivor of anything, you know, I think we have a mental connotation that it's somebody who's, you know, who's tough, who's, that word 
my parents, my family came to the United States in the, in the, in the early 60s. Leon came in 1949. But even when my family came, we were not survivors. That, that Nobody said that word. Nobody said that word. You know, I don't think people even talked about, oh, the Holocaust. It was more like we were the refugees, the immigrants, <laughs> and there's a pejorative word in Yiddish, the Grina, which, which just means like a greenhorn, but it wasn't always used like in a real nice way. And at that time, in America and all over the world, people were like, okay, let's move on. The war's over. Let's rebuild our lives. And there have even been books written about what's called the conspiracy of silence. So people didn't know what to ask the survivors, really. They were raising their families, trying to make a living. And they didn't like really know what to say. Right, but there are, there are people today that are still that way. Absolutely. That, that you know, they don't want to talk about it. They're saying, Absolutely. you know, enough is enough. Absolutely. And you read about that all the time. Absolutely. Which, and, and you know what? I get asked that. You know, people say, you know, you work with Holocaust survivors. First of all, are there still survivors around? Well, yeah, there are. But also, haven't we heard enough about it? And I think the answer to that question is like, look at the world around us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, look at the world around us. <clears throat> it's not that you're talking about that we need to remember a Jewish Holocaust as much as that if we don't tell stories and we don't ask questions and we don't keep while we have the opportunity to talk to survivors who are among us, what's going to happen? Like, really, what's going to happen? And it's a funny thing. One of the ladies that was there this morning, she absolutely did not want to tell her family anything that happened to her. She did have a tattoo. And she was one of the first people who had the tattoo surgically removed from her arm. This is going back in the 50s. So it was like a nasty scar. And you want to hear the irony? She just told me this today. When she got her first American Social Security number, the last four digits were the same oh, number as her tattoo oh that God. she removed. Did she tell her children? Absolutely oh, not. Wow. Absolutely not. So, Leon. Yeah, I still uh, want to bring up, like I said, when I speak to younger people there, I tell them this story that they should remember what happened there because it could happen again. They have to be alert, not to be afraid of anything. Anything can happen like they hear this harassment, the young people each other harass each other. Don't act on yourself. Act in a group and try to defend yourself because if you let it go out of place, it could happen again. You extinguish a flame, but it's small. Don't let it go out of control. That's what I tell him, you know, because it, like it happened in Germany, it started off little by little. Hitler didn't do anything from the beginning. Little by little, he took the Jewish people out to the street, took Jewish women in their, in their fur coats, washing the streets with the toothbrushes. Harassment like this started. I was harassed so many times in school from a teacher. A music teacher, no other teacher did this, but one teacher, oh, you Jew, you Jew, you this. It all depends, you know, different people have different uh, ideas. But the most important thing that we should tell the young people today, they should know what was going on and they should not let it happen, anything. You have to be aware and watch out because anything could happen. What happened today is impossible, things like that. <coughs> That's uh, anti Semitism is very great here, you know, and never was like this before. Never felt this before. But now every time you hear something else, again something started, this started killing like this. What can you do? You have to do something about it. And you know, quite a few non-Jewish families that helped. I didn't hear quite a few non-Jewish families um, sure lost their lives trying to help. Uh, quite a few non-Jewish families yeah. uh, tried to help uh, Jews escape 
uh, the concentration camps or, or uh, try to, to hide them. Do you have any experiences? Yeah, you see, it happens that uh, even my uncle, you know, he, he was hiding when they deported all the people to Poland. He was still hiding. Later on, a German woman brought him, they smuggled him to Poland. He brought him to Poland, he made, as a matter of fact, he made it with the last boat to England. And his suitcase didn't make it. He, and I had the suitcase still, and I saved the suitcase till after the war because I gave it to a Polish family. And I saved it for him, but nothing happened. It's uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, you find good people, you find bad people. Yes. You know, the only comment that I would add to that, and there's a, there's a, it might have even been Ellie Wiesel who said it, I'm not 100% sure, but that the, the issue is almost not so much hate, that the biggest issue is indifference, more so than, you know, turning your back ultimately ends up being more hurtful to people down the road than blatantly calling somebody a name. Yeah, I never gave up. I never never was afraid of anything. Nope. Because people, you know, they gave up. I said, not me. Everything I was against, I was fighting against them. Because, you know, what good is it? You know, they gave up and they passed away because they were afraid to do anything. They had no guts to do anything. That's what it is. You, you have that, to be. You think that's what helped you survive? That's what helped me survive too. Because I spoke up and I did not do anything what they wanted. It was against it. Like I said, they wanted me to go to work. This, this kind of work was <laughs> killing you. Carrying big rocks, like in Mauthausen, the same thing in Mauthausen. You had to go 186 ste steps of a hundred and carrying big rocks. I said, not me. When we came there, they said, all skilled workers put on Russian uniforms and you go to work. All of a sudden, I heard you going down the steps. I said, not Leon. I'm a little smarter. I dropped my uniform, jumped through the window, put some, uh, some uh, underwear on there, put myself on the floor washing floors. Everybody screaming, what are you doing? You're doing here. I said, he shut up. I spoke in German. I said, shut up, you know, I'm working here. So that's, you know. My brother-in-law and his father, they went down there. My brother-in-law was elder than, older than me, and my, his father was much older. When they came from, from, the, from carrying the stones, I already went inside in, in the... <clears throat> in the washroom, I wasn't allowed to go in there. I brought water for them, smuggled water out of them, they gave them some water. I put, brought some underwear for them. I tried everything, you know, to keep going there, to keep out of trouble. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. We, we have, um, not we, they're Leon's photos. Leon brought some pictures he wanted to share with all of you. I know that we can't really, like, just hold it up right here, but maybe you can come up and look later. But I wanted to show you this one. I don't know how many of you have seen this. This yeah. is a pretty famous photograph. Sure. Yeah. 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 We'll pass it around if you if you would like. Yeah. Leon, which one are you? Yeah. So if you can look, which, which you, you can pass it around there. I'm the smallest guy on the left. <laughs> I'm the smallest guy and the strongest Where guy. Where was that taken? It was after the war in eleven in Austria. In the DP camp? DP in the, in the concentration camp. That was um, the, by liberate, uh, the liberate day of liberation. Which concentration camp? Ebensee. Leon, my daughter, when she was in, in, high, in middle school. I can hear you. I'm sorry. My daughter, my daughter interviewed POWs who marched in Bataan. Yeah. And they, to this day, can't buy a Japanese car. At what point in your life did you forgive? I, I know, yeah, so. Have you forgiven the Germans? In one way, some Germans, not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you drive a Mercedes? No. Porsche? 
Hata ya masa. I have a question. First of all, thank you for coming and sharing your story. Um, my question is like, we see a lot of increase in anti-Semitism, not just here in the US, but also in Europe. So what is your message for the people who have the beliefs and what do you think of the increase of anti-Semitism? <laughs> Why? Why we have increased? Not, no, not necessarily why, but what? What does he think about the increase? Oh. What do you think about the high rates of anti-Semitism that exist today? We never felt this kind of anti-Semitism like it is today. There was always anti-Semitism, but not like today. It's getting worse and worse. That's why I said the youth has to be alert of it and try to fight it from the beginning before it gets out of control. Otherwise, it's too late. Yeah. You let the flame go out of control, it's, the fire is going too far. And what is your message for those people who still have to believe of, that are anti-Semitism? Hmm? What, what would be your message to people who are anti-Semites? What would you say to them? <laughs> I think before you act, <laughs> because the life you save may be your own. Yep. I want to show you some pictures of William right after the war. So I have, a, I have a question. So before Hitler, you guys were living in Germany, life was good, you had friends that were um, right. attorneys and doctors, yeah, right. and, and part of the German fabric, right. but slowly, you saw the, your country, Germany, turn against you. Right. How did, how did others react emotionally? You were unable to react because Hitler did it very slow that you didn't feel it, you know? First a little bit this, first he took, you know, cut, uh, started off, they, they, they boycotted the stores, right. they harassed the woman there, and then, then started little by little concentration camps. They established concentration camps. So everything came systematically, slowly. That you said, ah, oh, they don't mean me. You know, everybody thought the German Jews said, well, I'm a German, no, it doesn't mean, you know, they don't mean me. So everybody thought, you know, nothing's going to happen. They were complacent. Did they didn't see, think about it. And, and your neighbors were under a lot of pressure to turn Jews in and... Yeah, no, nobody turned me in. I, like I said, even, even they were Nazis, but they were my friends. Mm -hmm. See, I was in good standing with them. Like I said, the one German who was a policeman, I was the best friend with his uh, son and with his daughter. And now here's another story. This daughter had a, a boyfriend, which I... During the war, by coincidence, met in, in the Poland, in Krakow, in the concentration camp. I did not know that he was here. I was an, became an SS man. All of a sudden, he came down to the warehouse where I used to work. And I recognized him. I said, I looked, oh my God, I got scared. I said, you know. And I approached him. And I spoke with his name. I said, Mr. Eckert, are you looking for something? I, you know, the, we, the, this warehouse, we had all the belongings from, from Jews from Poland. And I asked him if he's looking for something. He didn't even answer. He didn't want to admit himself that he knows me. Right. That's what it is. <coughs> but, uh, you talked about how you watched someone who had really been horrible to you. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. I'll tell you. And I'm wondering whether that felt like justice to you. Did, did it, when the guy got killed afterwards, yeah. that was so mean to yeah. you? With the rock. With the rock? Yeah. Did that feel like justice to you, or did it bother you? Well, I, <laughs> I, I didn't expect it, you know, because he did it for me, and I was surprised. I can, you know, my feeling was, uh, listen, he tried to kill me, but... Uh, How old were you? This was, uh, this was in uh, 24. I entered the war. 
But really, my response would be, Leon didn't try to harm the guy himself. No, I know. Really? You know so, so, I mean, if, any, right. so if anything, th this guy never raised his finger against yeah. anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, just, I tried to help somebody. There have there'd been a great deal of violence that you'd witnessed, and maybe... It didn't make him a violent person. No. No, I didn't do anything. I tried to help him. I had a friend of mine that begged him, you know, I tried to help him. I gave him some bread for this. He just gave up. He didn't want to live. So I tried to help so many people. I, th I think one of the things I hear him say repeatedly is giving up is, is worse than anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I tried, I tried always to help people instead, you know, of being against anybody. I have a question. You speak that you had sisters and a brother when you were growing up. You had three other siblings. I didn't have yeah. two sisters and a. You had two sisters and a brother. Yeah. And your mother. How yeah. did they, how did they, did they spend the rest of their days in the in the ghetto or did they? Uh, my my <laughs> like I said, uh, I saved my mother and my sister. Because I avoid this company, my mother and my sister were already uh, going for the death camp. Right. When I mentioned the, the, the place, but it's mentioned in Schindler's List in the movie. And I heard about it, so was, the boss gave me a Jewish policeman and said, take him out. And I came before the policeman standing on guard. I spoke like an authority. I was dressed like a policeman as a civilian policeman. And I spoke in German like an, with an authority, not, you know, begging, you know. They make believe that I'm somebody. And I took him out and I took another woman out. But did they survive the war? And so my mother and my sister all survived the war. There's always a theme that goes through it. And one of the most remarkable themes, and Leon expressed it also, is this <coughs> idea of no fear. No, no fear, no fear. willing to take no. risks, standing up for yourself. It's no, no good to have fear. Whatsoever. And any time you hear a survivor story today, there's this element of the second I saw people around me have fear and shun, they weren't around anymore. And I had no fear whatsoever. No, I tried to, you know, always to be ahead of them, you know, uh, to outsmart them. Otherwise, like I said, you're gone. You give up, and it's no good. But I tried, even my friends, he uh, leaned against the back and almost, you know, he gave up. I said, them, don't give up, they are gonna help you. you yeah, just... I, I, I taught a course this morning at my synagogue about the, um, the importance of the modern state of Israel yeah. as we're coming around the corner mm -hmm. to <coughs> Yom Ha's Ma'ud and Yom yeah, Hazim right. Rome. Yeah. And um, I'm assuming you've been to Israel post-1948. Yeah. And so what are your thoughts about the existence of Israel today and its role in the world and as a, a place for... Oh, I, I had family, there's big families in Israel, but they all passed, uh, passed away already. You know, I was twice in Israel so far with the organization, with the Kaka Society, the Polish side. And it's good to have to created the state of Israel that was our saviors. I mean, uh, it's the best thing that could happen to us. Well, just as a statement, which is kind of interesting, is it's not just a Jewish problem. Um, I married a Greek Orthodox young lady whose family uh, lived in Greece and the city that she lived and her, my, my brother-in-law's wife's family uh, also were all occupied by the Nazis. And they they, shoot, they tell the stories of them marching out the men and shooting them. My father-in-law is actually, they lit his uh, home on fire in a two-story level, and his mother wrapped him in a blanket, threw a mattress out, and threw him onto the mattress to save his life. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that's really important, that it's really important to also include all the people who were also victims of Nazi and the hate, is it's not just a Jewish problem. If it stays just a Jewish problem, they'll be in trouble. It needs to be a world problem. Uh, they recognize 13 million people and more, I'm sure, were involved. And, and so that hate, it may start with one group, as you've said before. You know, say you said, uh, you know, you can't have the, the life you save may be your own. But uh, when there's, you know, problems such as the hate, it just starts with one group and moves on to the next.
we got another question. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm young, I'm only 43, but I perceive sometimes Jewish hate for yeah. no particular reason. And I don't understand the origin of that. And I'm, I sure, that here, yeah. I'm sure that you perceive Jewish hate in yeah. 36, 37 before it really ran oh, yeah. up. What was their excuse for those feelings? What was the, the Germans' excuse for feeling hate? Towards Jews. I don't know if I should say, but <laughs> why did if, if why did why did the what what was their reason for saying they hated Jews in Germany? This was Hitler itself. He started it off, you know. It, the Germans didn't hate so much Jews for the beginning. The blood Germans, you know. We we lived in in Germany a normal life so far, you know, from before Hitler. But Hitler started this whole thing. He had a Jewish friend. His, his, he was supported by a Jewish friend. But somehow, he became an anti-Semite and started all this business. It's uh, hard to explain why, why he started that. What was the idea that he started hating Jews? For what? Uh, Hitler eliminated his own leader from the, red, from the brown shirts. Ernst Röhm, right. he was the leader from the Brown Church, and he eliminated him because he found out that he was a homosexual. He was in charge of the big Brown Church, the same like the, the, black, the SS. They had the Brown Church and, and the Black Church. We have a special gift also that Dr. Stein recommended. Oh, um, that was a great you. idea. Uh, one of the great ways that we appreciate uh, the vitality of Jewish life in the world oh is through the God. state of Israel. <laughs> and uh, we planted a tree in your honor in the state of Israel. Thank you very and, much. And uh, thank you very much for being here. I hope to go. a strong spirit, a very strong spirit, a very kind and good man. We're blessed to have him here, and we shall not forget what we've learned today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I should look as good as you. It's a real pleasure to have you here and tell me my story. I hope this never happens again, that we should go to all the atrocities. Never again. This picture is me and was taken in 1945 at the liberation of the Camp Abensee in Austria. If I look at this picture, I remember the atrocities we went through and all the dead bodies and as lucky as should, uh, could only take a few more days, you wouldn't see this picture from me. At the time I was 24 years old. This was taken in Austria in the town of Abensee in 1945 and this is me approximately two months later when we were liberated this is an american soldier which was in charge as a liberator his name was uh, james blaylock after the war we were very hungry and we went out to the austin civilian population begging for food and they took me in for protection, but the Russian prisoners came there to try to rob people. So me as a prisoner there, they would not approach them. And these people, the American people, had to be taken in by them because they are not using the water from the faucets. They had a big barrel outside and they used the water for the American kitchen. That's why I took in three soldiers. This name was James Blaylock, the other one was Herbert Platt, and the third one was Lawrence Fisk. This picture was taken in the DP camp Bindemirha. I was dressed like a civilian policeman. The message today to this young generation is to never forget and to be alert what's going on around you. Otherwise, it will be the same could happen, that happened to us.